Hello everybody, I'm Bill Harris and uh, we are here with Life Questions today. We welcome you to this program which gives you cutting edge Bible researched answers to your questions about life. We're grateful to you for the questions that you have mailed us or emailed us and we have amassed a panel of local ministers to review your questions and uh, take a look at them from the Word of God. So let's meet them at this time. First up we have Pastor Jeff Kimberly of the Neapolis Church of Christ, followed by Pastor Patrick Kamler of Westminster Christian Church. And then there's Pastor Tim Smith of St. Mary's Church of the Nazarene, and rounding off our panel, Pastor Rich Reiki. Of, um, and he is with the, uh, let's see, the Teens for Christ, that is, Teens for Christ, and also the Delphus Christian United Methodist Church. We're happy to have you all with us. Okay? Now, Let's get into our discussion, and I, I think I'd like to take some questions that uh, would relate to Bible study. Uh, we have a question that came in. How do you study the Bible beyond just reading it? W what does that look like for you? And this sounds like it's probably a new Christian, somebody that's trying to learn to get into the Word of God. We need to encourage that person. Well, first of all, reading it is the best place to start. Most Christians don't read their Bible. Most Christians are biblically illiterate. So if you're reading it, you're, you're doing great. Keep at it. Don't give up even in the tough places. But the other thing I would say is pray. Pray hard. Uh, ask that God would open your eyes to see. Jesus teaches that, especially in that encounter with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that things are spiritually discerned. So the Holy Spirit has to be working in you to make sense of what you're reading. Mm -hmm. and, and I would the other part of that is get around other Christians. Uh, get, study in a group. Use the wisdom. Use wise counsel of others to help you to understand what you're reading. And the other thing I would say, and then I'll let these guys chime in, is practice what you're reading. Put it into practice. The Scripture isn't meant to be memorized. The Scripture is meant to be transformational of who we are so that we live the life that Christ wants us to live. Yeah. And so if you're just reading it for information, it's not helpful. It's, it's to be read as a means of submitting ourselves to the Lord so that He can transform us. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I read this particular uh, phrase in a book and it, and it stuck with me for a long time. It, and it's not so much about reading the text as it is letting the text read you. Really just being open to what God would present to you in the Scripture. And one of the ways by doing that is not... Uh, I had an old discipleship pastor who always said, we read the Bible entirely too fast. We'll, 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 we'll blitz through a chapter and like that's a great story or that's a great message or there's a lot of cool stuff there and then kind of move on instead of really kind of getting in and asking questions of it. Like, there is no problem whatsoever, and God, and I would hope your pastor, welcomes questions about the text. You know, why, okay, why does Paul write in Romans that God be true and every man's a liar? Like, we're all men lying? Like, what, what was going on there? What kind of drove that, that particular phrase to be put in there? And as you said, get around other people that are also, that are also seeking, that are also looking for answers and you know, and I would say, and, and I apologize if this adds to your workload, but bother your pastor. Um, <laughs> you know, email him, text him, however you get with him after church, you know, take him out to lunch, buy him lunch <laughs> and take him out and ask him some of these questions. I, I know personally anyone in my congregation was willing to do that. I would happily step up and, and help oh, them. Yeah. And, I, and I think you guys are all the same. These thing. are the things that we would rather talk about than yeah. all the other oh, junk. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I always tell people that the Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. It's, mm -hmm. it's, our, it's our map to get to heaven. And so understand that, first of all, but best thing you can do is keep a notebook, a journal, something with you, and as you read, if you have questions, write them down. Mm -hmm. Write your questions down. And keep them as you continue to read Maybe the the scripture will answer your questions for you as you read, but if they if it doesn't, take those questions to your pastor, to someone who you feel like is a more seasoned Christian than you are, mm. and have them answer those questions that you find in scripture, and and just journal it out. It's it will help you grow tremendously. 
Um, in Romans 10, 17, it tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so uh, one of the things I've done sometimes, not all the time, but is as I'm reading the Scripture, I read it aloud to myself. And there's something about it coming not only out of our mouth, but back into our ears. Sometimes we notice things that we wouldn't have noticed mm -hmm. before. Um, and the same thing can happen. I had a, a friend recommend recently that... Uh, just sit down and write out the passage. And that can be helpful as well because, again, you begin to see things that mm -hmm. you didn't see. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's something also about repetition. Uh, one of the uh, uh, suggestions I, I had, have had before and, and, I, and I've given is that take one of the smaller books of the Bible, say Philippians, and read it through. It takes about 20 minutes or so. Read it through every day for a month. And the repetition, um, one of the things that happens is on the 29th day, you're going to see something going, that wasn't there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, have, I haven't read that this month. This, I've been reading this this whole month, and I never saw that before. Yep. It allows God, to, the familiarity allows God to speak to you mm -hmm. from different sections. And yeah. uh, those, those are, that goes beyond just reading through a section and going on to the next one. It, it helps you. All three of those things kind of help you to focus. I see. I think your idea of Philippians is fantastic. What I do is I read a section of Scripture, and then I go back and I read whatever proverb it is for that day. Because yeah. there are 31 proverbs. So you can read a proverb a day, and you will have read through the book of Proverbs. Right. And then the next month, go back and do it again. Yeah. And you'll be amazed in month two, reading through the book of Proverbs, what you didn't catch in month one of mm. reading through the Proverbs, and month six, and so on. The differences in the, the way that your mind is opened. Right to the Word of God. And there are many ways to describe the Bible, and I like what you said about basic instruction before leaving earth, but the, the other way that I like to describe Scripture is it's God's autobiography of Himself, right? Mm -hmm. It's God revealing to us what He wants us to know about Him and what He wants us to know about how He relates to people. If we really believe that the Scripture is the inspired Word of God, then what we also believe is these are the things that God wants us to know about Him and how He relates to other people. And when I understood that, it changed the way I read Scripture. Because now it wasn't just somebody writing a biography about some person that walked once upon a time, but it was a re revealing of them from their own perspective and their own character. And that's what Scripture really is. Yeah. What about... the? There's, 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 a, there's a factor you have to deal with, too, where some people feel that all these versions that are coming out now seem, seems to make things more complex. And, and are we getting away from the true essence of, of, of Scripture with that? Is there a danger with that? I know there's an education with that, because in many cases, it greatly enlightens what God is saying. Uh, how far do we go with that? You've you got to be careful between a translation and it and an interpretation. of The message is an interpretation. The New American Standard or the English Standard Version are, Translation. are translations yes. of the Bible. So you have to make sure that you're not reading an interpretation, that you're reading a translation. And what I find helpful, now this is me, and I, I've been in ministry 15 years, is I read a section of Scripture, and it's spe specifically if it's a New Testament, I go back and I look at the Greek. Now, not all of us, not, none, none of you are Greek scholars probably watching the program today, but ask, ask your, as you read a section of Scripture, go ask your pastor, what does this mean to you? What does this mean? And what should I, what can I learn from this Scripture? Okay. My son does, my son does Greek and, and Hebrew. He, he loves them both. I'm not a fan of Hebrew, but I, I do enjoy <laughs> Greek. <laughs> okay. Another question, related question, why, this one is not very detailed, gentlemen, I apologize, but why does the Old Testament seem so different than the New Testament God? Let me read it this way. Why does the Old Testament God, I think that's what I left out, why does the Old Testament God seem so different from the New Testament God? And that's all they have. There. It can sure seem that way, can it? Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you think about the Old Testament God, he was present, but distant. And, and here's what I mean by that. Think about um, God in the Ark of the Covenant, right? He was in a box. You couldn't really access him. Remember the, 
the one, the guy that the Ark of the Covenant was falling. Yes. And, and he, he decided to touch it and he died. Yeah. Um, just by trying to save the presence of God. He died. And, 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 you know, you could read in the Old Testament of, uh, you know, Adam and Eve walked with God or, or, or Moses. And, and you think, oh, well, God is present. But they didn't have the access to God that we have today. In the New Testament. In the New Testament. Because once, only once a year could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies mm -hmm. and access the throne of God. And we can do it whenever we want. Okay. There's a... I mean, there really is a viewpoint that the Old, the Old Testament God was very wrathful, and then he settled down, had a kid, and mellowed out. You know, that's <laughs> what it looks like when you compare Old Testament God and New Testament God. But, you know, the, as Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. The full manifest, manifestation of who God is is represented in the person of Jesus Christ. So, you, so you're absolutely right. There is a certain level of access that we don't see in the Old Testament as far as what people had for, for God. There were Arks of Covenant. They had to rely on burning bushes. And I need to do what to my kid? You know, all this kind of stuff that really was, okay, I have to trust God. I don't have any scriptures. I don't have anything that I can compare it with. I'm just listening for a voice and, and moving forward. But people did that, and they had faith. We hear num numerous times that Abraham did that, and his faith was credited as righteousness. And... The, the God is the same, and we focus a lot on the, the wrath elements of it. We focus a lot on the judgment elements of what God, but there are a ton, dozens and dozens of examples where God is showing his love and his kindness. I, the Lord, the Lord, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, mm -hmm. and showing mm -hmm. love and faithfulness to a thousand generations. Um, there's a lot of that in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and we don't focus so much on that. And then when the ministry of Jesus starts, it's just continuing that same thing. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. I think it really depends on what stories you're looking at, but the character of God is unchanging. Right. He's loving and patient in the Old Testament. He's wrathful in the Old Testament. He's loving and patient in the New Testament. If you think he's not wrathful in the New Testament, Jesus, I mean, in the Old Testament, God talks about destruction and conquering the land and, and all of that type of stuff. In the New Testament, Jesus says those who who don't abide are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. I mean, that's not just temporary destruction, that's eternal destruction. So you got to be yeah. careful about it. I think part of it is, again, just growing in relationship mm -hmm. with God and not trying to have this dichotomy in our minds about, you know, well, he seems like a really mean guy in the Old Testament, really friendly guy in the New Testament, and so I'm going to get to know this friendly guy. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to see the love, the compassion, what the Bible says, the long suffering or the patience of God to put up with us. Um, and, and that's the same God we see in the New Testament. You, you, you read, you know, think of, think of the flood and Noah. You know, if, if God wasn't a patient God, when he flooded the earth, he wouldn't have made a, he wouldn't have made an ark. He would have said, you know what? You're not listening. I'm done. And been done with it. But if, when you read it with the, the patience aspect already in your mind, you see it just comes out as the patience of God. Um, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, the patience of God. Um, and, you know, God could have very easily sent Jesus way earlier than he did, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. And it's a plan. And, 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 you know, don't think of the God of the Old Testament as a different God than the God of the New Testament. They're the same God. They just... Their, their, their message changed. And we, we often think about Jesus as being the champion of the outcast, but if you go back and read uh, you know, the Torah, the Old Testament law, what you see is all of that was around not just punishment, but about protection for the widows and the orphans oh, yeah. and God mm -hmm. caring yeah. and His compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say every aspect that we see of God in the Old Testament is reflected in the New. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't think that, uh, you, if you think Uriah uh, touching the ark. I mean, you might, might want to talk to Ananias and Sapphira, you know, oh, yeah. uh, who lied before the Spirit and, and died. So the every aspect, uh, characterization that we see of God in the New Testament is in the Old as well. So it's the same God. Very good. I'd like to continue on this theme. We're going to take a break right now, but, you know, there's there's 
technically, by some people, discussion about the authenticity of the Word of God. Is it really inspired of God? Let's deal with that next. We'll be right back right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back now. Thank you for staying with us. We have another viewer question that I'd like to put to our panel. What does it mean for the Bible to be inspired? How do I really know it's true and not just a bunch of stories? So how, how do you answer that? So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed which means that it came out of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. that, that is the Greek word. It came out of the mouth of God. It's breathed out by God. So if it's not true, why would God not... Why, if it isn't from God, why would He breathe it out? Why would He, why would he breathe it out if it wasn't from Him? And, you know, um, knowing that, I think, gives you a, a different perspective on the Bible. Knowing that God... It's not just somebody like Paul sitting in a prison cell going... You know, I, I think I'm going to write about, I think I'm going to write to the Corinthians about love as I'm chained to this, I'm just going to do that. Here we go. You know, uh, it, it's, God said, you know, I want you to write to the Corinthians about love. I want you to, to write to the Philippians about joy. I want you to write to these people about this. And, oh, okay, because this is from me. And, and that's, that's the best thing we can know, is that everything comes from God. That's we find in here. Okay. I, I always look for, uh, this probably makes me sound like maybe something of a bad person, but I usually, I like to look for continuity errors in, in movies, just to kind of poke fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, making a movie, making television at all, I mean, it's a, it's a hard enterprise, so you're not going to get every little detail right, but there are so many times where you can just see things that were put together wrong, not put in the right place, that kind of thing. There was a... a image that I saw, and I think it was, uh, it was during a lecture that I was watching, and the premise was that the Bible is the most hyperlinked book ever made. Mm -hmm. And what it means by that is that there are so many parts of the book that go back to other parts of the book. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's impossible to look at the text as an entirety and see major issues of continuity. Now, in terms of contradictions and stuff like that, you have to go deeper into the text to kind of find out what they're talking about, which if I don't want to get into that right now. But the other part of that is that so much of what is done in, say, ancient Near East, Near East scholarship, which is when the time roughly that the Old Testament was written, over that period of time, you would take a similar, say, Egyptian text, story, book, whatever, and you would say, okay, that is true. Now I have to find something that disproves the truth of that particular text. With Scripture, a lot, and not, not everyone in academia, but a lot of people in academia have taken the opposite approach. If they've taken an element of the Old Testament and said, this is false, I have to find something else to corroborate it. The, point, the, the problem is, is that, that that other point of it never actually happens. There's never actually anything to corroborate the fact that the Old Testament is, is not telling the truth. And the fact that the books, the letters have survived for so many thousands of years and had so many thousands of copies and throughout still a time. And and it, it's, yeah, and it's still, it's still around, it's still alive, it's still vibrant. There are very few copies of Homer's Iliad, okay? There's a dozen, maybe less than that, copies of that in mm -hmm. existence. When people don't value things, they don't stay alarmed very long. Okay, it's not very good anyway. What's that? It's not very good anyway. Yeah, it's hard to read. Like the, never mind, I won't go there. Um, but things that are not valued, people that things that do not stand the test of time, things that are not inspired, we don't hang around to them as human beings. We pitch them, we move on to something else, we think our idea is better, so we, we put it aside. Scripture has withstood the test of time. Probably, you know, if you want to do a deep dive on this, one of the things that you can do is kind of research the inspiration of Scripture and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And one of the things that comes up over and over again 
in modern research is they've uncovered all these scrolls that, one, help us to interpret Scripture better. So we've got more documents with the Greek and the Hebrew words and the Aramaic words to be able to better translate modern English translations, which helps us in our scholarship. But it also shows that thousands of years have passed, and those copies of copies of copies of copies have been consistent right. yes. over time. Right. And no other book can say that. Right. And the, the painstaking detail that the scribes through the ages have seen mm -hmm. in valuing the Word, mm -hmm. preserving the Word, the way that it was written, speaks to its authenticity. Oh, yeah. And probably more than that, I mean, if you're asking the question, how can I have faith or trust in the inspiration of Scripture? You know, if it's God's Word, then I have to listen to it. If it's man's word or it's man's opinion, if it's kind of like the pastor's sermon on Sunday, you know, he might have had a bad day. Um, guess what? I don't have to listen to it. But the problem is when we say yes and in, by faith we receive the word, then it demands something of us. It man, demands that we respond to it. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. You know, there's another part of this question another viewer wrote in asking um, something similar. How can we know the Bible is reliable historically and theologically. I think you've gotten into some of that already, but uh, you want to Yes, um, in? much of what we've been talking about has been the internal consistency of the scriptures. And I was thinking about the movie mistakes as well. There's mm -hmm. actually a place, moviemistakes.com, that you can go to it. <laughs> and they have people on set that are intentionally trying to keep that from happening. And still, they come up with dozens of mistakes per movie. Whereas the Bible was written over Hun 1500 years, 1, years yeah. 66 books, uh, different authors, and yet it's utterly consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all internal. But there are also external evidences. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the big things that's happening these days is archaeology. And archaeology continues to confirm things about the scriptures until I think it was the 1990s there was scholarly doubt as to whether David ever existed because they never found anything that had his yep. name on it. Yep. And then lo and behold, right in a place that the scripture said that this was a, uh, one of David's uh, fortresses, they found something that had his name on it. Oh my goodness. Suddenly archeology span is, and, and day after day, every year there are uh, more and more archeological discoveries oh, yeah. that oh, yeah. prove the exact uh, things that uh, well, the scripture says. You know, you can go visit Corinth. You can go visit yeah. um, Philadelphia. You can go visit all these c cities mentioned in scripture. And not, a, not even that, you think about Noah's Ark. It says it came to rest on Mount Ararat. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It's still on Mount Ararat. It hadn't mm -hmm. moved. Mm -hmm. That it's, was in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to the one in Kentucky. I have been to the one in Kentucky. <laughs> Well, Please continue. It's, well, it's wonderful. But, it is but, not the biblical art. But you know, Pastor Tim has, has a good point here in, in, in looking at archaeology. I've been to Israel several times, and maybe you all have been, uh, both in television news and uh, with our church. And one of the things that, that slows down the development of Israel is that when they're digging new ground to build, every time they stick a shovel in the ground, they dig up history, and they have to stop, find out what it is, how valuable right. it is, before right. they can move on. So you're absolutely yeah. right. The, the authenticity is there. It's oh, yeah. right there. Absolutely. And kind of to that point, Israel has gone through so much upheaval. They were, they were conquered over and over and over again. They yes. had a civil war. 37 times, I think. Yeah, right. in the intertestamental period, they were conquered a few times. There were, there were some new landlords, some new leadership. They did their own thing. There was so much that has been taken down. And then just with the re emergence of the state of Israel back in, in the 1940s. 1948. Yeah, so there's so much of that history that is still buried, still under the rubble somewhere. So you're, you're right. Every time you, you throw your shovel down, like, oh, well, where did this come yeah. from? And it's going to confirm or prove something else about yeah. Scripture that, once again, we find that Scripture is accurate. Yeah. What a coincidence, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, that does slow it down. But it's, it helps us understand Scripture more and more. Yeah. Let's move on to uh, another question that had come in. This is a juicy one here. I was listening to a podcast and the speaker said that hell isn't real. I grew up in a church and heard a lot about hell, but this speaker said it could just all be made up. How do we really know? How do we really know whether there is a hell or not? 
No. Well, my first thought was pretty simple. Jesus said it was real. <laughs> he believed in it. And if he believed in it, I think that's, that pretty settles it for me. Uh, but I think there's also a, uh, 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 another thought, and that is that we all want justice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a big word today, justice, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. e uh, eternal justice. And where is the justice if Hitler's in heaven? I mean, that just, the, there has to be some kind of a final justice system mm -hmm. that God has instituted. And, and that would include those who have rejected him aren't going to be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And there has to be, so hell is a logical conclusion yeah. to me. You know, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Bingo. Uh, or um, Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on the left, on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the internal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If that doesn't prove to you the existence of a place of eternal torment, I don't know what, I don't know what will. Yeah. You know, and it's, it, the Bible even says that when Jesus died on the cross, he went down to hell. So all of those put together should yeah. give you the existence. Pastor Rich? I, I always wonder why people believe what they believe. Like what, what is the agenda in this thought? You know, the first thing, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, oh, but yeah. test the spirits to see whether they are from mm -hmm. God. So and I tell my congregation this, just because you hear me speaking, it doesn't mean it's true. I, you know, I love Steve Brown, uh, Key Life Ministries. He says 50% uh, of what I'm teaching you is false. I just didn't know what 50%, right? It's not because I'm trying to be false, but I'm human. I make mistakes. Go to the Word, find in the Word the truth, and seek it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. We need to be encouraging our people, right? Yeah. There is no human teacher, right. no matter how well-intentioned, that's going to be perfect. So, surprise, you're going to find things on radio, TV, podcasts that are not accurate or that are false. But more than that, why would somebody want to believe that there isn't a hell? And usually it's because somewhere in their mind they have this sense of compassion, right? They, they, they think, well, as best as I know, Grandma didn't accept Jesus, but I want Grandma to be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so we start, to, we start to change our theology based on and what we believe about God based on our own on personal emotions. feelings yeah. mm -hmm. and our emotions. Mm -hmm. sure. And that is a slippery slope. We can't yeah. allow, that's us reading into the scriptures what right. we want it to say rather than the scriptures teaching us. Right. Okay. Well, that's what we've only got about, you, we got 30 seconds left. You want to chime in? You haven't chimed in on this yet. You get, yeah, real quick. quick. Comment, very quick. I, think, I think hell is a real place. I think we talk about the kingdom of heaven as a already not yet proposition where the kingdom of heaven is here, we can bring it in, but it's not yet in its fullness. Hmm. Then we say the thing about hell. There are people who are in hell right now. They may not be physically in a place, but they feel de they're dependent on drugs, they're broken, they need healing. They are in hell right now, but they can get out of that and okay. find truth in Christ. And on that, we'll have to leave it right there. Gentlemen, thank you very much for all your thank expertise you. and your, your, uh, your, your insights into the Word of God. Well, that's our show for today, and we want to make note of the fact that we will be gone until the fall, and uh, we're just taking a hiatus, and we'll see you next fall. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Goodbye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.